Hello and welcome to Live Questions. I'm Bill Harris, your host. Each week, this program takes an insightful look at current events through the lens of God's Word to answer viewer questions about how we as Christians should conduct our lives. Well, we've invited a group of local pastors to research your questions in preparation to discuss them and their findings right here on this program. And I want you to meet them at this time. First up, we have Pastor Dave Burkhart of Westminster United Methodist Church, followed by Pastor Chris Ewing of the County Line Church of the Brethren. Then we have Pastor Rick Lamb of Hume United Methodist Church. And rounding off our panel today is Pastor John Berger of Transform Church here in Lima. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all with us today. Thank Good you. Glad to be here, Bill. Here. Thank you. Right, and I'm uh, armed here with a list of some of the questions that viewers have been sending us. I'd like to leave with one broad general question. I think it can take off, it can take off in several directions. And it says here, how can I be happier in my life? See? Uh, I really feel like there is more to life than the struggles that never seem to end with me. It's a very broad general question, but there, there are people who feel this way in several areas, several viewpoints of their lives. You're all nodding your head, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, who, who's going to answer first? Wait, well, well there, there's yeah. uh, a lot of different ways to be happier in life, uh, but the one that um, comes to mind, and I'm sure as pastors we all agree, mm -hmm. is to get more Jesus in there. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and so, uh, you know, we, we tend to think that the things of the world are going to make us happy, and and so we try and acquire more and more stuff all the time. And, and God's word has always said that it's not the stuff of this world that makes us happy, mm -hmm. but it's the things of Jesus Christ. Where we I, store our hearts. Yeah, I really noticed that when, when I first became a Christian. Um, and uh, my, my second mission trip, actually, I ended up in Haiti. And, and I just felt such a peace about being there. It was a place that was... Um, Really, you kind of have an evil spirit when you get to, mm -hmm. to Haiti because, you know, when you get there, everybody else is black and, and we're white and we stand out like crazy. And, and, um, and we listen to the, the witch doctor's drums beating all night long. And, and I still had a piece about it that, mm. that I was in the right place at the right time mm -hmm. and that God put me here and, and God was going to take care of me. And, and when you experience peace like that, phew, Man, I'll tell you, there's no greater joy in, in the world. So what would you say to this person who wrote in saying they want to be happier? Um, I would say, you know, examine your relationship with Christ and see where that is. And, and maybe you're not where you need to be. Um, and it's, it's difficult to know sometimes uh, as a non-Christian. In fact, we have a statement in our church, you can't know what you don't know until you know what you didn't know. And, and so, <laughs> so sometimes when we when we don't know how good God can be, mm -hmm. when, when we experience God in a new way and become born again followers, we can look back and say, wow, this is really great. And the things of the world just don't mean so much anymore. Yeah. Well, and you have to have a clear expectation of what makes you happy. So of your own life. Um, if you expect that money is going to make you happy or having this item is going to make you happy or this perfect relationship, then your expectation is off and you're never going to reach that expectation. It's just like <clears throat> in any situation you find yourself, have clear expectations of, of what it is that you want. And so you're going to get those expectations from the Word of God. And so dive into your Word, um, whether it's for um, a minute a day to an hour a day, a chapter a day, one verse a day, whatever it is, just get into your Word daily. And then um, just ask the Lord to, um, to show you joy for that day, whether it be in a relationship you have with family, friends, or um, being able to be thankful for the things that you have. Um, you know, I walk outside my house and sometimes the Lord will just press upon me and, and I just look at stuff and I, and I just thank the Lord and, um, for some of the things that, the blessings that I have in my life and, and which brings happiness, joy in my life. So um, I would just, it's just that little, perspective. Look for the happiness and you will find it. I've often heard pastors say that there's a difference between the happiness and the joy yeah. in that happiness is based on conditions. And then when those circumstances change, there goes your happiness. But the joy of the Lord can remain no matter what the circumstances. That was, you, that was that? my thought. That was uh, thought? Happiness is circumstantial. Mm -hmm. It's often fleeting. 
Joy is transcendent and it's abiding. Happiness comes primarily from the world and the things of the world. Joy comes through a relationship with Jesus. Jesus would say in John chapter 16, in me you have peace. Mm -hmm. In the world you will have tribulation, you will have these trials, these things that, that seemingly make life continuously difficult. We're not promised a rose garden in this world. What we are promised is an abiding peace and the joy that stems from that, that comes from a relationship with Jesus in the yeah. midst of those things oftentimes. Yeah. Right, well, and it was uh, back in 1979 or 80 that I uh, got real good instruction on that very thing uh, that uh, uh, because the instructor was telling us how and he drew a chart on the board and he said, I started out at zero love, joy, peace, hope and happiness. And and uh, he's referring to the gifts of the Spirit out of mm -hmm. Galatians 5. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he said, and then I met Jesus. And immediately I went from zero, love, joy, peace, to 100% in one instant. He said, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. But he said, you know, but I didn't stay there because... I, in, you know, I got into sin, one thing or another, and so I lost a little bit of my love, joy, peace. And, but time didn't stop. <laughs> and as time went on, I kept losing my joy in little bitty pieces until I started losing bigger chunks of joy in mm -hmm. smaller spaces of time. Wow. And, uh, and he said, and then I started faking it. <laughs> when I went to church, I didn't have 100% joy, but I wanted to have 100% joy, and that's what people expected. But then he got so low that he was only faking it to 70%, and then 60%. But what he learned was everyone else was faking it too. <laughs> Nehemiah tells us that, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. It is our strength. So we, yes. we find that, that when we, we rejoice in the Lord, when we find our joy in Him, that we have the strength to become overcomers in the midst of the tribulation. So again, those things may or may not go away, but we can be triumphant in those things through the joy of the Lord that gives us the strength to do so. so and so the, the way it concludes is don't stay at 60% love, joy, peace, but begin to confess your sins mm -hmm. right. and you will be restored to mm -hmm. that 100%. And that's why I like uh, John or 1 John 1, 9, where it says, confess your sins and God will forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that keeps us at 100% joy. And, and that's how I've lived my life since 1980. Excellent. But don't Excuse. expect yourself to, to not have those downs. Oh, sure. I mean, sure. every believer comes to a time where they're not happy, you know, where, where it is a struggle. All of us goes through suffering of some sort of, of another. Um, I always tell our congregation, you will be, have a blessed life following Christ, that, but it doesn't mean it'll be easy. You'll, you'll have your hard time. So come with those clear expectations of you're going to have your ups and downs and you're going to well, have your like struggles. Just you like said, the, in the world you will have tribulation. It's right. a promise. It's a promise. It yeah. is a promise. Yeah. And that goes for pastors too. I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I thought you were exempted. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Shift only. Would be nice. Right. Would be nice. So, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I share it with my congregation when I'm feeling a little down and and let them know that we as pastors, we have those same struggles. And mm -hmm. so we just have to really look for uh, opportunities to bring us up. And a lot of times that's fellowship within the church. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we continue to read the scripture. We continue to understand God, pray, fellowship, uh, do all those things. But sometimes we need that personal one-on-one -on -one with someone in our church mm -hmm. or uh, maybe a lot of people in the church. So I think Wesley had that right when he started the class meetings and getting together and intimate groups. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. You know, that, that brings on a companion a question here. Uh, we're talking about joy, peace, troubles and, and the like in the world. There's another question that comes in. Why, why does God allow suffering? Why do we have suffering in the earth? Here's one where I, I think we misunderstand uh, God's will for our life. Um, Looks like they're blaming God. Yeah, it's, it's not God's will that anybody should suffer, but 
Um, but man has sinned and will continue to sin. And, and while God doesn't want us to sin, um, he will allow us to suffer the consequences of whatever sinful be behavior mm -hmm. we get into. Right. Uh, For every action, there is a reaction, right? Yeah. Whether it's a, a good reaction, a blessing, or a bad reaction, some kind of a discipline or suffering. Mm -hmm. So this is God's law of reciprocity, what a man sows, that shall he also right. reap. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. Well, with Adam and Eve's disobedience, it obviously plunged the world into chaos to where in Genesis chapter 6, the narrative says that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was yes. only evil mm, continually. continually. So we, we see that, that God isn't the, the problem with the suffering, but as you continue to read through the word, there is a promise of a Messiah, and then the Messiah comes, and the Messiah dies on a cross for the sin of humanity, at least for whoever will believe, and rises the third day and is coming back. So, so really, over the last 2,000 years specifically, God has been in the process of alleviating suffering, if you will, through his Redeemer, who is redeeming human beings who will one day come, and as we were talking off air earlier, will restore all things to how things were prior to the fall. And that's so the, the, suffering suffering will will, away. the suffering will be eliminated mm -hmm. completely forever. There will be no more tears, no more weeping, no more sorrow. It will all be taken care of totally and completely. But for now, God is redeeming a people for himself in the midst of the suffering of this world. Were you going to add to that? Uh, well, I know that, uh, you know, since Christ died and rose again, that he's been reversing the curse. He reverses it every time someone comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus, mm -hmm. that uh, the curse is reversed in that person's life. And and not only that, but he's, re I mean, we, we say how wonderful it was that uh, 3,000 people came to salvation that first time Peter preached the gospel to the people. And, but here's the truth of the matter, that 3,000 people are coming to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ every 23 minutes in the world today. Is that, how many, yeah, 3,000 people are coming to saving knowledge of Jesus every 23 minutes. Oh. And, and so we are experiencing the greatest influx. We're the biggest and the uh, fastest growing religion on the planet. And, and so how can it be worse? You know, it's getting better. And so we, we rejoice in that. And, uh, and so I forgot our question. <laughs> <laughs> suffering. Why is there so much suffering? And so, yes, there is suffering, but it's, it's getting less and less. I mean, because the curse is being reversed and we're moving towards that perfect world. All right. Thank you very much. Now, listen, I want to make another interesting twist on this. We got a viewer question in, why did God create evil? That's the question now. That's the question. And I assume they're probably talking about all the way back to the first uh, angel, uh, Lucifer, and what happened with him and how it's permeated throughout the world. We'll deal with that in a moment. We've got to pause for a break and we'll be right back to get on that question and even take it further right after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back for more good, fiery discussion. And another viewer question that came in, uh, the viewer asked, why did God create evil? If God is really our creator of all things, why would he create evil? And I assume this person is talking about the creation of Lucifer, who was God's choice angel. Lucifer made a decision to go bad. And that led to him becoming... Well, he got kicked out. He was expelled from heaven and he came down to earth and began to take down the name Satan or, Luz or um, the devil and began to spew evil out all over the place. And so God is being blamed for having created him. 
How say you? Why would God create evil? Actually, I'm going to defer to Chris here because oh. I, like, I like the way he said he was going to answer well. this one here. <laughs> <laughs> did God create evil? Yes, he did. And the reason why that is such a simple uh, question to answer because um, if you say God did not, then who did? And then you're also in, implying that there's another creator, a God force. And we know that there's only one God and God created everything. And so where I go in, go at it from there is um, the free will defense. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you can study this in philosophy. It, in order to have good, you have to have evil. If you don't have evil, then good isn't good, it just is. And so to have dark and light, you can't have dark and light without one or the other because that's just how it works. And so God gave free will. And so in order to give free will, he had to give the choice of good and evil. And so you can't have free will without having evil to exist as a choice for good. So angels have free will. Um, us as creation, as humans have free will. Um, so yes, God created evil. Um, in order to give us free will. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Well, and that free will then uh, leads us to making the decision one thing or another. Isaiah says, Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions of mixed drinks. And, and so that's the evil side. But God also gives us Jesus, who is the... Uh, the uh, righteousness of God, and and uh, when we take Jesus, we receive that righteousness ourselves. Okay. I, I like what what Chris was saying earlier here, and um, and God did did create that evil, um, uh, but I think there was a deeper reason in it. And oftentimes we hear people say, "Well, how would God know whether we love Him or not if we didn't have that free will?" Uh, if we didn't have the option to choose either good or evil. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think, is to limit God somewhat. Um, God knows all. He knows the condition of our heart. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what it really comes down to is how would we know if we love God if we didn't have the opportunity to choose? Mm. And, and so, um, you know, God wants the best for us. Um, he loves, he doesn't want us to commit evil. And by uh, accepting Jesus Christ into our heart mm -hmm. and avoiding those evil uh, evils in the world, we don't bear the consequences of that sin and we can experience the joy of the Lord. Yeah, I think one of the biggest misunderstandings <coughs> of scripture is, is that when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the mm -hmm. tree mm -hmm. in, in Eden, a lot of times we are taught that evil entered into the world which that's not true, sin entered into the world, but evil did not because the tree that they ate from was what? The, the knowledge, knowledge of, of good, good and, and evil. evil. Good and evil already existed. The knowledge of, of the difference mm -hmm. of it did not within human. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we understand evil existed clear to the very beginning, the creation, even in the garden. That's why we know that the serpent was, you know, did evil. Um, and it wasn't until we ate of the knowledge of it that then sin and entered a world where we knew the difference between. So evil was always there. It See, did not and the fascinating thing about that is that Adam and Eve, uh, Satan was telling them that God was holding out, that they could be gods mm -hmm. if they did this. Mm -hmm. So their understanding was to be more like God, I have to disobey God. And then when we get to Hebrews, I think it's chapter 6, Jesus is talking about how uh, he learned obedience through the sufferings. And the last verse in that chapter says that God gave us discernment, what of good and evil. So through, God's obe or through obedience to God, we have the access to the knowledge, the discernment of good and evil. So Satan, the liar, the deceiver, the one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy, said, disobey God and you'll be like God. In the New Testament, we learned that God wasn't holding out at all. He was going to give us discernment about right. good and evil, but through obedience. Well, we have to remember that God gives us the choice, gives us freedom. 
and you know even connecting with today you know that's why especially for me as an american you know like i i enjoy freedom because freedom comes from god and only by god that's right um and so the you know our political system is kind of based on that biblical principle you know whereas the enemy you know satan is all about getting you away from god and to taking that choice away so god's about freedom giving you that choice and that's why evil exists whereas you know, Satan is about testing and trying and proving that, that we do not, um, should not, we don't deserve God. We don't deserve, and, and so God, uh, Satan's trying to use anything and everything to keep us away from that choice, that freedom that we find in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very interesting when you, when you look at it from that aspect of, well, yeah, sure, in order to know what freedom truly is, to, to have the freedom of Christ and to have that love from him and that, you know, going back to that free will defense, that choice of good and evil needs to be there. And you can't have it without it existing. And I think the closer that we get to Christ's return, we're seeing an amplification of that. Right. Uh, just over and over again, how, how Satan is really starting to uh, try and separate us from God uh, in so many different ways. And I'm sure it's gone on forever and ever, but uh, still I think we're seeing it more and more and it's really ramping up right now. Right. And, this, and this question should lead us to the greater question, who or what are we going to choose to align ourselves with? Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. The, the darkness and the evil or the goodness and the light of Christ? And mm -hmm. that's what, what it should all ultimately drive us to. Very good. Another question, this is a whole new subject area. Um, this question came in. A friend of mine has been referring to God as a female and a male. Is this correct? And this, is, this gets us into the whole confirmation now where people don't want you to use those terms. He and she, his and hers. God identifies himself as the father, the creator, and therefore male. He created Adam in his image and then created Eve off Eve. of Adam. And so for me, God is my father, not my mother. Um, he is my father. He is the groom. We are his bride. He always identifies himself as male. Mm -hmm. Jesus likewise is a son that sure. is male. Mm -hmm. right. The spirit of God is referred to as he throughout mm -hmm. scriptures. This is actually not a new thing. My wife 25 years ago sat in on a religion class in a lo at a local university and they were propagating the same types of things. So this is, it's basically, it's what the enemy does. He regurgitates the same things at, at different times to try to, to get people off track in their spiritual right. walk. And Jesus is also referred to as the, uh, the groom of mm -hmm. the church. Right. And the church is his bride. Correct. So yeah. it's, it's stated. Right, but right, even right, in right. the Lord's Prayer, we start out our father right you know we recognize him as our father and and jesus says in john 15 10 if you obey my commands you will remain in my love just as i obey my father's commands and remain in his love so there's two examples of father and his love so yeah like you say uh, god has always referred to himself in the male personage and uh, there's just no way around it. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's just this desire or, or um, fallacy that we have to be politically correct right. in this yeah. world that that's, we live that's in the today. Thing here. And, and to me, it's just gone to a point where it's just so ridiculous. <laughs> well, there's a, there, there, there is a move afoot now to, to get rid of the gender thing. Um, and uh, we're, we're not distinguished that way anymore. Which is very interesting because when you begin to take away gender, you begin to take away your identity. And so, well, in order to really form something into what you want it to be, you have to take all of the things that way that identifies it so that you can reform it into what you want it to be. And that's what we see is going on in our culture to reform us into something that we're not. And you're trying to reform, you know, men into something that they're not, women into something that they're not, and the family into something that it is not. And especially now, I mean, we the, they've been doing that to the church for decades, you know, centuries really. But I mean, that's just what we continually fight against all the time with uh, false teachings. Paul uh, dealt with it 
um, even in his time, and that's why we have many of his letters. He is dealing right. with issues, and that's what I try and tell people all the time. Well, why do we have all these issues in our church nowadays? You know, they, we didn't see those in Scripture. Well, you're not reading them the, the right, you know. <laughs> Paul is addressing issues. That's why he wrote those letters in the mm -hmm, first place. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and you, especially when you put them in, with some tense in there and you read them out loud, you can see, you hear Paul, like, chastising, you know, those people in those churches. So we need to understand that it is God who identifies us. Yeah. It is, it, we find our identity in him. He is the one that created us in, our, in the in world. In his own image. In his own image. Before uh, we were known, he knew all of our days, according to Jeremiah, right? Yeah. All our, our days before we even lived them. And so he is, if you truly want to know who you are, who God is, dive into the scripture and find out who God is. Begin prayer, conversating with him and asking him questions. And you will discover who you are because he is the creator. You know, I also see this as an attack on the family. Yeah, absolutely, family absolutely. I remember I testified once before the White House Conference on Family years ago that wherever this country is headed on the road to moral decline, families will be the first to get there. Mm -hmm. And I, I see this as a part of, a part of the effort to disassemble, or if that's a word, let me see, just take apart, just yeah. take apart yep. the family unit that God put together and make it something different and something that is more convenient for people who want to live uh, another type of a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Fathers have a role in the house. Yeah. Mothers yeah. have a role in the house. Yeah. Each one is unique and different and the other cannot fully do what the other is supposed to. And you need to have both to have an expect, you know, a perfect, both for healthy, boys and for right. the girls. Now I that's mean, not. I mean, if you're you find yourself a single parent, mother or father, whatever, then you know, I would challenge them, hook up with a church where you can find, you know, mentors, mentors for those kids and for yeah. yourself and for because that's what the church is for, right? right? You know, that's what the church is for, even when we come into widows and stuff. But yeah, to sit there and say, hey, you know, these identity politics that we find ourselves in you know, that will tear down our society and especially it will affect our church greatly and it'll chase people away from God. Well, we're seeing it more and more all Absolutely. the time. And, yep. and, and we can't forget that we're told to be uh, in the world, but not of the world. And so we just really need to be careful what, what attitude we take. Um, the Bible's clear, God created them male and female. They yep. both have a specific role. And, and so we just need to honor God's word in that. And God uh, created he had a great you how plan. he loves you and loves you how you are. Yeah. Okay, well, we're out of, very quickly. We're just I was just going to say, time. regarding all of this, we need to make sure we stick with the word and not the opinions of man. Yes. yes. Amen to that. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been a great, fiery conversation. Enjoyed all of you and certainly hope we've helped somebody out there by answering their questions. Well, I'm Bill Harris and we're happy to be with you today. We'll be back with you again next week on Life Questions, so stay tuned. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>